Hi, my name is Ryan J. Haddad, and I'm so thrilled to be here today to talk with you about my play, Hi, Are You Single? Well, are you? Even if you're not, watch this video for more. I've been in love with theater since I was an absolute toddler, since before I have memory, I would crawl around my living room putting on plays of Disney movies all by myself. And then when I turned five, I started to recruit family members to put on those plays with me. And so it stemmed from childhood. I think even before I had ever been to a play, I knew that I wanted to perform. And so I found ways of make-believe and storytelling that ended up being very theatrical in spirit, even if I had not yet been exposed to the form itself. So it's a, it was a very early, and it has been a constant love affair ever since. My interest in writing started in grade school, I would say. I was particularly drawn to the one time a year or two times a year when we'd be asked to write a personal narrative and write a story from our own experience. And those tended to be the assignments that I did best at, that I got the best marks on, and that I enjoyed doing the most. And I had no idea what form that was going to take in my adult life. But I continued writing for school, you know, always doing particularly well in English and writing classes. And then I started my own family newsletter that was called the Ryan Haddad Monthly. And it pivoted then after three years to the Ryan Haddad Quarterly for another three years. So that was six years of basically tasking myself with writing a newsletter or a magazine. The quarterly one was more like a magazine, which was totally, you know, centered on me and was filled with ego. But I was just a kid trying to emulate like Oprah magazine or something like that. And I got used to it and I did it more and more and I enjoyed it. But I also enjoyed like people reading it and then calling me and saying, great job. You know, I liked the satisfaction and the gratification of that. But I still didn't know what form that was going to take. I thought maybe I would be a journalist and or a theater critic. And that being a theater critic would meld my interest in uh, the stage and also in writing. That would be the way to, to do both. But I soon realized that I wanted to be making theater and not reviewing it. So that wasn't going to work, but maybe I'll still do journalism. I don't know. And I get to college and I take a journalism class my first semester. And the wonderful, wonderful professor, Jim Underwood, a uh, renowned journalist in Ohio. I adore him. And I'll never forget. He said, your writing is so strong. You would be an amazing asset to our journalism department. And you would be a very good journalist, but I don't believe that you are a journalist. The flair and the personality and the deep personal nature of your writing calls for something else. So then I pivoted to writing essays uh, in the English department, personal essays, and that was felt write to me that felt like exactly what I had been doing in third and fourth and fifth grade, not realizing that you continue to be, you could continue to do that all through college. And then finally, uh, I was writing plays in the theater department, short plays that I wasn't that excited about, but that, you know, I was learning how to do dramatic writing. And finally I had a mentor come from California to Ohio for a week long workshop in autobiographical storytelling and solo performance. And I realized it took a little while. It wasn't instantaneous, but I realized that that would be a way to meld my love of the stage and my right uh, and my passion for personal narrative, creative nonfiction, that I could make creative nonfiction on stage and play myself. And that could be sort of the way that I moved into a career as a autobiographical playwright. Um, I don't know that I would say I'm obsessed with writing because it's hard 
to get myself motivated to write. I really only write on deadlines. And when I'm thinking about a new project, it usually just ruminates in my brain for a really long time, but I won't put it on the page until somebody's forcing me with, with a reason to put it on paper. And then I'm usually rushing to do it and, or I'm putting, continuing to procrastinate until the very last moment. I have a deadline that was due yesterday that I still haven't even started, okay? So I don't know. I'm not the kind of person that needs to get up and get out of bed and make my coffee and sit down and start writing no matter what day it is or what the project is. No, I can't do that. Um, I'm very interested in rewriting, and I'm very interested in revising, but starting something new is very hard for me, particularly now during the pandemic. And the motivation to create for theater and art form that is kind of under siege at the moment and doesn't have um, a lot of help in building itself back up, I, I, I struggle with that. But I, I can keep trying because I have faith that theater will return and that my plays will continue to be produced, hopefully beyond this digital realm of what this Woolly Mammoth and I Am a Production of Hire You Single currently is. But um, yeah, I, I'm very proud of my work as a writer and I have full intention in continuing my work as a writer, but the process uh, eludes me sometimes, and I am not as disciplined a writer as I think I would like to be. I particularly love playwriting and the form of dra dramatic writing so because of the engagement with the audience. In most of my plays that are solo work, there is engagement with the audience directly. There's question and answer, or there's a moment of participation of some kind. And I rely on them as my scene partner when I'm, when I'm doing a solo piece. Even now in my plays that are going beyond solo work that including multiple characters, I have a play called Good Time Charlie, which is about my family and my gay uncle and our relationship as two gay men. That is not a solo and that does not rely quite as much on my rapport with the audience, but it does acknowledge fully that we are in a play and the drama of the evening is catapulted forward by the fact that these family members are together putting on a play the same way that we used to do when I was a little boy in the living room in the backyard. Now here we are theoretically on a professional stage doing it again, but this time we're telling our own story. And that is completely dependent on the fact that it is a play and that we are doing a play and we are characters in the middle of a play. So I always have some sort of meta acknowledgement of the sanctity of theater and how sacred it is and how important it is to have that audience relationship. Um, that's really why I'm, I'm most drawn to it because there's nothing more magical to me. And I would, you know, my whole social life prior to this pandemic was I'm going to go to plays three or four times a week. And maybe did I get comps to this one? Do I have to buy a ticket to this one? Can I get, Hey, do you have a, a, a discount to this? Like, that's what I would do. I would go to plays and I would schedule for friends. I'm going to see you on this night because we're going to see this and that. And so Everybody's social lives have come to a screeching halt because of COVID-19. But I think that, like, I can't wait to just be with my friends again and sit in an audience and be moved and be brought to tears and be able to laugh openly with a room full of people because there's nothing better. And so I think that my love affair with watching it is just as powerful as my love affair of making it. And that is why they come so, they're so hand in hand and why I haven't yet uh, written for the screen in any major significant way. I first heard about Woolly Mammoth Theater Company in 2014. I was spending a semester in New York as a senior in college. And there was a play 
at Playwrights Horizons called Booty Candy. And it had originated at Woolly Mammoth. And I loved Booty Candy and I was obsessed with it. So I thought, oh my gosh, any theater that would premiere a work this bold, this edgy, this sexy, this funny is a theater that I want to work at. And fast forward a few years later, I had done Hi, Are You Single in the Under the Radar Festival at the Public Theater, which was at the time uh, had its lead producer, Maria Manuela Goyanes, uh, who is now the artistic director of Willie Merritt. And she f fell in love with Hire You Single when she saw it in Under the Radar and said, I want to do everything I can to help you get this show up and get it seen by more people. Then she took over Woolly Mammoth and suddenly was in a position to make the choices and put the shows on the stages and decide who got to see what and when. And she told me from the beginning, I'm really interested in Hire You Single. I don't know what form it's going to take, but I want to, br to bring it to D.C., so the first attempt was going to be summer of 2020. We were going to do it in a summer festival in their smaller uh, studio-like space. And then that obviously was canceled because everything was shut down. And then they bumped us up from the, a summer festival because the summer was gone. They brought us into their main season on their main stage, which was going to be great. It's going to be wonderful but it was going to be a smaller capacity audience. And then, oh, I don't think we could actually have a live audience. Why don't we do it on film instead and give an offering to the people during this time of theater uh, absence and scarcity and void, really. And then I Am a Theater Company in Los Angeles was very interested in, in partnering because they had wanted me to film a solo work and I didn't know what that would look like. And I certainly didn't want to do it in from my parents' house where I was staying at the time during COVID. Uh, and so I got those two theaters together and that's how we got to the place where we are now for this theater on film moment that's going to run for the month of February, 2021. Hire You Single is a story about sexuality, disability, and being horny all the time. I am a... a 20-something, late 20s now, horny gay man who wants sex and intimacy, but mostly wants love. And I had to write it because I didn't know why I was having such bad luck with men. And what was this about? And did it have to do with my disability? Wasn't it? Was it about the disability? Was it just about my personality? What was it? And so I set out on this kind of exploration. And I feel I had to write it because I didn't see any depictions in the media, on stage, film, TV, that showed authentic, real, disabled people or disabled actors playing disabled characters having sex or being in a love affair or being in a marriage or being romantic with anyone in any form. And when you're in your teens and 20s, all you want, I mean, especially adolescents and teens and late, late teens, you're just trying to fit in. You're trying to belong and you're trying to find a person or several people who you want to be uh, connected to and romantic with and intimate with. And that wasn't happening for me. And I didn't know why, but I did attribute it to the media and their heinous lack of representation of disabled sexuality. Because I don't think that the population at large, the non-disabled population, sees disability as sexy because no one has ever shown them that before. No one has ever shown them that that is possible. All that we see are these highly attractive, highly photoshopped, you know, uh, airbrushed model-like figures or celebrities who are the upper epitome of gorgeousness. And that isn't to say that disabled people aren't sexy, hot, and gorgeous. We are. But if the media is not showing us as that, then 
the average person is not going to have the presence of mind to say, oh, wow, I think that person is really hot because their minds have not been conditioned to see us in that light. So I think the more stories we can tell, the more we're giving the country and the world permission to see us as sexy and desirable and worthy of romance. Hi, Are You Single is about me, a solo play about me at a younger age. So I'm playing a version of myself, a younger version of myself in my quest for sexuality and romance and intimacy. It begins with me on FaceTime with a stranger with my shorts and my ankles. You can see my leg braces. You can see my underwear. You can see my torso. And I am trying to get some pleasure through my phone with this stranger who is presumably uh, disrobed on the other end of the line, on the other end of the video chat. And that doesn't go so well. And I have a hunch that it might be because of my disability. And why is that? So it sets us forward on an exploration into and out of gay bars uh, as a 21-year-old and navigating the way people are reacting to me in those spaces, in those gay male spaces where I don't particularly feel welcome. The character of Ryan does not particularly feel welcome. And what to do? So then I continue to do research and I ask, literally ask the question, would you be open to dating someone with a disability pointedly to men? And some or one in particular says no. No, they wouldn't. And gives the reasons why. And that understanding and my recognition that it is not me, but it is them, brings me into my own sexiness and my own power and my own form of chasing after what I want. And in my own empowerment, the character of Ryan, who I play, who is me, a younger version of me, recognizes his own hypocrisy and his own forms of discrimination that aren't related to disability per se, but are equally shallow and ugly and discriminatory and complicated. And so it becomes a self-interrogation and a self-implication just as much as it was a learning experience of why is this happening to me? It then becomes, why am I doing this? Same thing to other people. I want audiences to have some fun. I want them to make a margarita and have some fun or a virgin margarita or a virgin Shirley Temple. If you don't drink, take a drink, have some fun, whatever form of drink you want to take. Enjoy yourself. It's a comedy. I want you to enjoy the comedy of it. It's a comedy with deep uh, ideas that can get serious at times, but it's joyful and it's empowered and it's energized and it's sexy. And I want people to walk away or, you know, turn the channel at home when they're finished watching it from their sofa, realizing that yes, disabled people are sexy and that we are viable and that we are entitled to the same types of relationships and romance and sex as our non-disabled counterparts and that we shouldn't continue to be excluded in the way that we have been by society. There is such a profound deficit of disabled stories and it's so egregious that when we get one thing Everyone flocks to it and tries to see themselves in that one thing. But it's just not possible to, for all of us to relate to every disabled story because we all have different disabled stories. And so for the disabled community, it is so important. Representation is so important. And 
the breadth of the disabled community, the expanse of the disabled community is so vast and there are so many kinds of stories that are waiting and long overdue to be told. We've got to, we've got to keep telling those stories with great detail, great specificity, great individuality, so that everyone has a chance to see themselves and beyond our community for the non-disabled community viewing it recognizes that one size does not fit all, one story does not fit all. Because if they only see one play, movie, television show, they're going to think that every disabled person is like that character in that television show or movie or play. And especially harmful if that role is wrongfully played by an actor without a disability. So if your only representations of disability available are severely limited to begin with, and then you put somebody that's faking it, how are we ever going to show people the truth of who we are as disabled people? Uh, we need authenticity. And that is uh, both in performance and also the writing and also the general creation and leadership of stories that must be told, must be told. And it's also about employment of disabled artists, of disabled creatives, disabled writers and directors and executives. It's about employment. Every time you tell our story without including us at the table, you're taking income away. You're taking livelihood away from people with talent and drive and tenacity who deserve that compensation that is going into the hands and the pockets of people who are not from us, but are using our stories for their own gain without giving us a piece of that pie. And I think that that is just as important as representation and authenticity. I adore William Mammoth Theater in DC and I am a theater in Los Angeles. They've both been champions of me uh, since well before we were doing this production. Uh, their staffs have been champions of me and they've supported me and my work uh, from afar and sometimes directly. I am a, gave me the unsung Voices Playwriting Commission in early 2020, and I'm so grateful for that. And Wooly has been, and Maria Goyanis at Wooly have been championing Hire You Single and waiting for the day they could put it on their stage. And it's the first time in my career as a playwright that any of my plays is being fully produced with a full design team, a full uh, costume, scenic lighting, sound design, with, you know, when I say costume, I, I mean, this is the first time I'm wearing clothes that didn't have to come out of my own closet to do this play. And uh, they see the importance of disabled stories. They see the importance of gay and queer stories. They see the importance of intersectionality. They are highlighting people of color in their seasons. And they are recognizing that the diversity of voices on stage is going to directly impact the audiences who are watching the theater and the people who come into the theater in the first place because they finally have the opportunity to see themselves. There are two amazing regional theaters in two beautiful, wonderful cities, uh, Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles. These are two extraordinary, wonderful nonprofit theaters. And every nonprofit theater in the country is struggling in this time when their audiences have been ripped away, their ticket sales and their revenue that were budgeted for ripped away, and very little help coming from the federal government. Just now we're starting to see, uh, thanks to Senator Chuck Schumer and others and the Save Our Stages Act, there's more that needs to be done. We were long abandoned during this pandemic because of a lack of leadership in our government. And uh, 
we need help. The theater needs help. I am and Wooly surely need help to rebuild and regain and come back stronger than before. And so uh, if you have the means to support your local theaters in any way possible, whether it's buying a ticket to whatever they're offering via streaming or giving a non, uh, giving a tax deductible donation to one of the nonprofits in your local community, or just making sure that when it comes back, you are there to buy the tickets and walk in the door and sit in those seats because actors need it, technicians need it, directors, creatives, staff members, uh, administrators, all forms of folks uh, need our support. And theater is much more than the one person on the stage or the cast of actors on the stage. There are hundreds of people that go into a production. And one of the joys of having this be my first production, even if it was a time of pandemic and we were doing a lot of it on Zoom and a lot of it uh, remotely, there were, you know, 40 staff members, maybe even 50 or more that were involved between both theaters in getting this show off the ground whose jobs were were to support me and my work. And they were getting the chance to work for the first time in eight, nine months. And that was a great gift to not only have such talented people supporting me and my story, but knowing that this work was giving them the chance to do what they love and do what they do best and to be compensated for it uh, because that is so severely lacking in this pandemic time. I think that this show is about hunger for intimacy and hunger for touch and hunger for connection, which are things that we are all hungry for right now. We're all completely isolated with our pods of people, whether they be family or roommate or spouse. And I know we all want to be together. And we all want intimate contact with other human beings, whatever form that intimacy may take. And this show is specific to a desire for intimacy as a disabled person. And that desire for intimacy as a disabled person far predates the pandemic. And so I wonder if non-disabled audiences will be able to resonate with and connect to the story in ways that they haven't been able to be in the past because of this moment that we're in and recognizing how what they are experiencing in this moment is not so rare for disabled folks and how can they help us not be so isolated and so uh, disconnected when all of this is over and we are able to socialize again. My name is Ryan J. Haddad, and if you enjoyed this conversation about my play, Hi, Are You Single?, and also about the importance of theater in this pandemic time, please go to woollymammoth.net and buy your tickets to Hi, Are You Single? and uh, enjoy it anytime you want during the month of February. <laughs>